just want to invite you to stand with us to begin worshiping our Lord. i 
Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good, will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. And I think so often we get stuck in bad situations and in worldly things that, you know, we worry and we stress over, and it's hard for us to keep God at the center of our life. Um, and we don't always give him the ability to be there in the center and to hold us, you know, during our bad, our trials and our difficult times. And so often he wants to hold us and he wants to show us just how wonderful and how merciful he is. And we just don't let him because we're selfish and it's, it's all about us and why are we having a bad day or why are things going wrong for us. And, and I do it. I worry. I worry all the time. I worry about everything. I worry about being late. I worry about, you know, anything, really. And it's so hard for me to give God full control, you know, and I have a relationship with God. I have a good relationship with God. I, I pray to God all the time. I, you know, I talk to God. I read my Bible. But it's not often that I have consistent faith in God. And I, it's something that we daily have to work on. And, and it's hard because, you know, I'll give God maybe part of a situation or, you know, a little bit. But I'm still there. I'm still, you know, holding back a little bit. I'm not giving him everything. I, it's, that's just too hard. It's too... It's too difficult, and I think so often we do that, or I do that, maybe I'm the only one. But it's, it's hard to see God's plan in the middle of a crisis and in the middle of something so terrible because we just don't understand why would God do that to us. You know, why would he put us in a bad situation? And I just want to give you a couple examples where maybe my faith wasn't as strong as it should have been. Um, when I graduated from high school, I all my friends were going to Southern. That was just place to be. That's where everyone wanted to be, and I was not going to Southern. I was going to Appalachian State, and I didn't want to be there. I didn't know. I knew one girl there out of the 17, 18,000 people there, and I think I saw her maybe two times the first year. So I knew no one, and I was angry, and I was bitter. I was angry at my parents. I was angry at God. I was angry at my friends. I was angry at my boyfriend at the time, because I we were apart, and I just didn't understand why. And I was just really worried, and so I had a terrible attitude about it. I had a terrible attitude about the whole situation and about, you know, being there. And I was really, was mostly worried about my roommate and who my roommate was going to be because, you know, this is a public university. It's not Southern. There's all sorts of people there, you know, terrible people. <laughs> and I was, you know, worried that I'm going to end up with, you know, someone that drinks all the time or brings home a different guy every night or is a pothead and this and that. And, you know, I'm just struggling with that, and I'm not in a good place in my life. But, you know, my relationship with God at the time was not not very good and not very strong. And so I was worried that if I got stuck with someone like that, that I would fall down into that spiral and get into that lifestyle. And I didn't want that. But luckily, God had a different plan. And my roommate, her name was Hannah. And I think I met her on Facebook, like, during the summer. But when we got there, she was such a blessing and I think that God obviously really knew what he was doing because she is one of the nicest, most wonderful people I've ever met in my life and she um, is a wonderful Christian and has such a deep love for God and a deep love for everyone that she meets. She, uh, you know, Spencer was talking about how people, you know, even outside of the Seventh-day Adventists are not always kind to everyone, but she is one of those rare and few people that is, and she taught me so much about God and about relationships and just learning how to trust in God, you know, in, in the terrible times that we have and in my terrible situation, she kind of showed me, you know, how naive and dumb I was being about the whole situation and how if I would just take advantage of the opportunities I've been given that I could just see so much better. And I'm, I am so thankful that I went to Appalachian and I did meet a lot of wonderful people and God really showed me a side outside of the Adventist world that there are wonderful, loving Christian people out there as well. So that was a good opportunity for me. Um, so I just graduated from Appalachian in December, actually, and I got my Bachelor of Science in Communication Disorders, and I'm planning to be a speech pathologist down the road sometime. Um, but my plan for my life was that I was going to graduate, apply for grad school, and get accepted immediately. That was just it was going to happen. That's the way it was going to be. So I applied. I applied to six schools. Um, I applied to mostly in-state, a couple out of state, one in Utah for my dad. Um, <laughs> but 
And so I'm waiting, and I, I did this like last fall, it was probably around September, it's very stressful, and you know, so I'm just waiting, and I'm worrying, and I'm you know, thinking about what's gonna happen, but I'm like, I'm, I'm pretty good, I'm, you know, my faith is okay, I'm kinda, I'm confident that I'm gonna get in somewhere. And so I started hearing back, I think it was in the February, and I got denied from University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, which of course is where I wanted to be, and I got denied, and so I was a little upset, <laughs> A lot upset. I was crying and really sad, and it was just difficult because I was kind of like, okay, I'm supposed to get accepted. I'm supposed to go to grad school, but then I'm okay. I'm like, I have five more schools. Somewhere is going to accept me. There's five more, and so then they keep rolling in, and I keep getting denied. I got another one, Utah. I got denied by them, and uh, East Carolina I got denied, and another one, and I got denied by Appalachian, my own school that I went to, didn't want me back. Um, and so, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, then, and then I was waitlisted. I got waitlisted at two schools. So I'm thinking, okay, it's going to be okay. One of these is going to want me. I'm going to get accepted by one of them. And I get another letter saying that they're full and they have no space for me. So I was denied. And then I finally got the last one and I prayed and I was like, you know what, God, even if I don't get in, it's, it's going to be okay. But then I got denied and really wasn't okay. I was <laughs> not really okay. And, it, you know, I felt like a failure, and I felt like I had been rejected from everything. I mean, six schools, that's kind of a lot. <laughs> it was pretty bad. And, and I think in human terms and in our eyes, I was a failure, and I had been rejected by six schools. But I think in the eyes of God and in the eyes of faith, it was a blessing in disguise. And, you know, if I had been accepted, I might not be here speaking to you today. Um, and I might not have been able to buy my car and wreck it <laughs> to work, but also be able to be home and be with my family and my friends and work on, you know, relationships and important things in my life. And so I think that it has been a good thing for me and it's, you know, taught me that I don't necessarily need to rush through everything in life and taking an extra year off, I think I will survive. But on top of that, I think that, you know, along with this, we have expectations of people in life. Um, whether we admit it or not, we expect people to treat us a certain way. We expect them to, you know, act a certain way. And far too often we put our faith in the hands of people instead of the hands of God. And we often have people at the center of our hearts when we should have God. I know that I'm that way. I get distracted easily and I'll, you know, I'll be praying to God like in my car. And then two minutes later it's like I'm thinking about food or what I need to do later. <laughs> Something like that. And I get so distracted easily. And those are just little things. But we do it with big things, too, with relationships, with, you know, situations and jobs and everything. We, like, crowd our lives instead of having God at the center. And I think when we have God at the center and we have a good faith foundation with God, it's so much easier to get rid of the stress of all the other things. And I think that we do this as a church as well. And I know that in the past we have, we have expectations of pastors and leaders and you know, things of the church and when they mess up or things happen and it's, it's catastrophic, it's huge and it's a huge issue. And because we put them on such a pedestal, we expect them to be like God and they're not, they're not perfect either. You know, no one is perfect, no one is exempt from sin except for God. And I think that that's something we need to, you know, remember and realize that we can't, we can't always keep people at a higher standard. We just have to really rely on God, and that's all. And I think we do it in relationships. We do it in everything. Our challenges on this earth, as ugly and as hard as they sometimes are, are temporary in the light of eternity. Most things are not important at all. And throughout the course of our life, everyone, everyone on this earth and everything will disappoint you. They will let you down. They will bring you up. They will help you. They will hurt you. It will never be consistent. Nothing in this life is consistent but God's love for us, but his grace and his mercy for us. And that's why it's so important to daily work on our faith with God and to keep him at the center of our hearts and our lives. Hebrews 10.23 says, Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. And Romans 8.28 says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. He wants us to love him and trust him, even in the worst situation. And when we prioritize time with God, all the bad situations are pushed out. 
they're pushed away and they're pushed aside and, and leaves us with God and Him holding us. And we will never be exempt from bad situations and bad things, but those dark moments will only last for a little while. And they will be much more bearable when God is holding us during them. James 1, 2 to 4 says, Consider it all a joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. This quote was read at Justin's funeral last year, and I think it's just a neat little saying. It says, there's hope for tomorrow, even when things look dim. There's hope for tomorrow when you put your trust in him. Though darkness surrounds you, he's always there, with arms that will hold you in his loving care. Just when you thought you've lost everything, he's right there beside you, with comfort to bring, and you'll know his assurance. Will never depart, for he's dwelling inside you, right inside your heart. So next time you have a bad day, or a bad month, or a bad year, or a bad situation, I hope that you'll see God's love for you, and see how hard he's trying to be at the center of your life, and to hold you, and to care for you. And I hope you'll consider a joy that God gives us trials, and gives us situ situations and chances to have faith in him, and to trust him, to make all things for good. Um, I've asked the guys to come play a song for me, and during that, the deacons are going to pass out um, some little papers that look like this, and I just want um, you to listen to the song and just hear and reflect on how good our God is and how constant his love is and how he can revive even the worst situation and the worst thing. And I want you to write down, maybe you have a person, maybe you have a situation or something that you've been holding on to or something that Satan has hold over in your life and something that you can just write down and you can just give to God. And just while they're playing the song, maybe you want to pray over it or maybe, you know, just think about it and just give it to God and know that nothing is wasted by our God, no bad situation, no bad anything. Everything is good in the eyes of our Lord. So if the deacons want to come and pass out the paper, so you don't have to worry about getting burned by this. It's magic. So um, if you could just hold it up, it would just kind of disintegrate. So.
No.